in some past videos, I've talked about structures and data tables as a way to uh, store and read data in a very efficient and useful way. Today, we're going to talk about a different way to do something very similar, and that is with data assets. The way you can think of data assets are just slightly more flexible individual entries of a data table. So where we have data tables being one single asset with a bunch of entries in it, a data asset would just be one of these entries as a asset in and of themselves. The difference being is that a data table is read only and a data asset you can actually write information to. Or maybe it's just easier for organizational purposes to have them as individual assets, like in my case. So let's go over the basics of how to set up a data asset and how to create them. And then I'll come back into my own project here to show you some of the implementations, how it works in my own game. Creating a data asset is actually not that difficult. What we can do is simply make a blueprint class and make one of type primary data assets. And we'll call this something like item data assets. Then when we open it up, we see a normal blueprint editor. And there's two things you can do for a data asset. The most important one is adding variables. So for a item, as I've been using for the example for the past couple of videos, if you haven't seen those videos, don't worry about it. Um, we of course want a texture. We'll want an item ID. We'll want a value. We'll want a name and we'll want a description and give them all the proper types that come with that. And now we have our template for our data asset. So after we've done that, we can come into miscellaneous here and create a data asset out of that. So we can create a item data asset and let's make a sword. So when we open that up, we see all of the variables that we can fill in. This tool is going to look like bricks. Item ID is going to be zero. The value, let's say it's worth 100. The name will be Iron Sword. And the description will say it's sharp but weak. And of course, we can make a bunch of duplicates of this and also make a shield and then also make a potion and so on and so forth. And then if we make a blueprint class, so let's just go with a normal actor and call this actor, just pretend like this is the player. We can make a variable here for the held item, the item that's currently being held. And that can be of the type item data asset. And when we see here, when we compile it, the default value, we get a drop down menu of only the assets that are items. So we can give it a potion, a shield, or a sword. And pulling that into our event graph, we can get any of the data out of there. So we can get the item ID, or we can get the value, just like you would with any other actor. It's important to note, though, that we can set these values as well. So we can set the value. When you do this, you might think, oh, we're just changing the value on the item that's being held at the moment. That is not correct. What you are doing when you are setting a value in a data asset variable, so you're not setting the value of the variable, you're setting the value inside the asset itself. Meaning that, meaning that if you have 100 different actors, all with a reference to this type of data asset, in this case, the sword, and one of them changes the value of the sword, the asset itself gets changed. So all of the other references to it now also have that updated new value, which can be a really powerful thing if you know that that is the case. If you don't know that that's the case and you're using data assets for like your enemy health, for instance, I just as an example, that would mean that if you hit one of the enemies on screen, all of the enemies take damage. But that's of course not what you want. So do be aware of where you can and cannot use this. I want to show you one more thing, though, because you might have noticed that this data asset, there's an event graph here, where if you're familiar with something like structs, there isn't. And there is a good reason for that, because you can actually make events and functions on data assets. So let's make a function here and uh, say get sell price. Because this float variable here for the value, we probably would use that for when we buy something, right? When we go to a shop, it would cost 100 coins. But 
Usually in games, when you sell that item then to that same shop or a different shop, it would sell for a lower price. So we can make a function on the data asset itself for get sell price. And there we can simply uh, like get a return node and say that we get the price divided by two when we try to sell it. So that will be half of the uh, actual value. And we can add that pin to our return node, call it sell price. And now we have a simple function on here, which will calculate the sell price based on the value variable, which we can get sell price for the held item, gets us a node with a return pin of the sell price. And that is the real power of data assets, is the fact that they can hold variables and you can use them for a bunch of different things, but they can also hold functionality on them as well to manipulate that data and make some simple calculations. You're not going to want to program an entire actor based in a data asset, but it does save you quite a bit of headache being able to make simple functions like this. So let's go back to my own project and show you two ways that I am personally using data assets in two different ways. The first way I am using data assets in my own game here is by leveraging them for my combat system. And if you've seen my combat system tutorials, you'll be more or less familiar with how this works. I have a child actor here, which is the sword, and that sword has a array of attack data assets, as well as a special attack for uh, when it's attacking up and one for when it's attacking down. And those attack data assets contain a animation override, which is just the animation that should play in the attacking state for this specific attack. The forward force, which is a little push forward towards the enemy that you're attacking, just to make things feel a little more satisfying. The damage that the weapon should do when executing this attack. The knockback it should deliver. The particle system on impact. The camera shake on impact the sound of the weapon slashing, the sound when the weapon hits, and the character are making a grunting sound, all on a per attack basis are implementable here. The exact implementation to see how all this information is then getting read and put into action is a little beyond the scope of this video because it's also done in C++ and not on Blueprint, but you can probably imagine that when I have a reference to this attack data asset, I can just pull all of this information out of it and use it in all of my other programmed systems. And this way, if I want to make a second weapon and a third weapon, which eventually I will do, it's as easy for me as just putting different data assets on them and I have an entirely new combo. Matter of fact, this system would even allow me to add data assets to a weapon on runtime. So actively during gameplay, changing up the combo that my character can do. The other way I use these is in my game instance where I have an array of events. Not events like custom events or whatever, I just call them events, which are data assets which simply have a bool variable, a yes or a no. So realistically, this is just a fancy bool array. The reason I'm using data assets though is because it is a lot more design friendly to use data assets for what I use these for. And these are pretty much just flagging whether or not certain events have happened. So if you can read the text here, uh, the first data asset here is in level 02. Have I beaten the combat tutorial enemy yet? Because if I have and I come back to that level, he shouldn't spawn in again. So in that level blueprint, I simply look up this data asset and check are you true or false? If you're false, spawn in the tutorial. If you're not false, so if you're true, don't spawn in the tutorial. The same thing with uh, range enemy tutorials, the save point tutorial, the uh, enemy spawner tutorial, and then I have a couple of keys, which are items that you can pick up. Of course, if you've picked them up once, they shouldn't spawn again. So this array just keeps track of what actions the player has already completed and which it hasn't. And then I also have a simple event set here to change a specific item in that array to a specific value. And I have a function that returns the value of a specific item that you give in. So if I go into this level, for instance, which has a reference to the game instance already in the level blueprint, we can just ignore all of the programming that's already in here. Uh, we can use that reference that I have uh, to get event 
has happened, which gives me a drop down menu of all of the events that I have made, all of the data assets, and just simply returns the true or the false out of it. And we can also set events happened, which again allows me to select a data asset of that specific type and set whether or not it should be true or false. I could have put this functionality on the data asset itself, by the way, I want to point out. In this case, I opted not to because it's easier for me to just be able to do that through a reference to the game instance itself. So that's a few ways that you can leverage data assets in your own game and a couple of things that you do need to be aware of. They are references to existing assets. They are not instances of anything. So if you change one of them, all of the other references to it also immediately have that same change going on. But you can store information in it and you can do some simple programming with that information, such as the buy and sell price that I showed you or the two functions that I just showed you in my own game. Those could have been on the data assets themselves rather than through the game instance. And a very big thank you to all of my Patreons. You can see them on screen right now. If you want to help out supporting the channel, there's a link down below in the description to the Patreon page. And a special thank you to Eleanor for supporting at the Cave Digger tier on Patreon.